Okay, let's get going. Um, there's inevitably a few late faces that will arrive at some point, uh, such is the way of these things. So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to passenger, uh, Public Transport Information Coordination Group. It's not a good start if I can't even get the name of the group right. <laughs> Uh, so, um, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, last time we met was uh, back at the beginning of March. Um, so, uh, there's a few things to uh, to update on. Um, so, um, there are a few names that I suspect that are new. So, if we do some introductions. So we'll go down alphabetically. So Adrian. Uh, hi, um, Adrian, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Hi, I'm Adrian um, from a bus operator uh, named Ember, uh, responsible for software engineering. I'm just sort of listening in. Excellent. Aiden. Hi. Aidan Proctor, um, product owner for scheduling software at Omnibus Solutions, part of the EPM group. Yeah. Dan? Hi, Dan Saunders. I'm at a conference today. So, yeah, I'm a head of products at Basemap. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to hearing what's going on. Cheers. Excellent. Face to face contact. <laughs> uh, Darcy. Yeah, hi Tim. I'm I'm not new to the group, but um anyway, I'll uh, say hi to everyone anyway. So I'm Darcy from uh, Passenger Technology Group, um, product manager responsible for our city's um, applications and software. Yeah, thank you, uh, David Batchelor. Yeah, David Batchelor from Ticketer, helping operators understand our system bods and trying to join the two together. Okay, uh, David Fitzgerald. Hi, I'm a junior product owner at Ariba UK Bus. Okay, welcome. Uh, Josh. Uh, Josh Goodwin from BusTime.org. Uh, Keith. Keith Willis at React Accessibility. Uh, Mark. Good afternoon. Um, Mark Jones from DFT recently joined um, seven weeks ago. Yeah, welcome with a different face on to uh, how you've joined us before. Yeah, so previously at EPM, worked with Aidan um, on the EPM product suite. Yeah, um, Mira. Uh, Mike. Hi there, Mike Baxter from Leicester City Council. Um, mm -hmm. I manage the RTI system in Leicester uh, and we're doing a big expansion, so I'd like to just keep keep abreast of the latest developments. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mira. Um, hi, I've got Mira. I'm um, doing open versus open data. Sorry, I was just um, um, putting video on and coming up mute. Yeah, OK, uh, Neil. Hi there, I'm Neil McKinnon, um, Stagecoach Research Team, and I'm a sort of geographic information system mappy type guy. Excellent. Uh, Nick? Nick Carey, uh, Transport Data Consultant. Uh, Stephen? Stephen Penn, uh, KPMG, uh, working on the uh, FAIRS data work stream on BODS. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Peter? Peter Soner from Eto World, always interested in data quality. Yeah, uh, Richard. Uh, hello, yes, uh, afternoon, uh, Richard Hall. I work with Peter at Eto World, and as he says, uh, we, we are keen on data quality, um, and uh, we both previously worked at uh, a number of local northeast 
local councils, including Northumberland. Okay, yeah, welcome. Uh, Rob. Hello, Rob West, um, lead software architect at Illidium, um, focusing on data quality in BODs primarily um, with Trans Exchange and also now looking at NetX Fair data too. Yeah. Um, Nathaniel. Hi, good evening from Singapore. I'm your, yeah, I'm your foreigner. And yeah, Tim and I, we've, we've uh, virtually seen each other for a lot of times now. So I'm just generally curious uh, of the developments in the UK and also happy to share uh, best practices from this hot country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Teresa. Hi, uh, Teresa Jolly, um, secretary for this group. Uh, and Tricia. Hi, I'm Tricia Wright. I'm the Facilities and Information Officer at Nottinghamshire County Council. Thank you. Um, and I've realised I've not introduced myself. So I'm Tim Rivett. Uh, I run Artig and I'm the uh, chair of this group. Um, so hopefully you've all had a copy of the agenda and the minutes. Um, shout out if there's anything wrong with the minutes. Um, thank you, Teresa, for doing them. Um, there's a few actions. Uh, oh, apologies before we get on to that one, because the first action was for Triumph, but um, he's um, <coughs> uh, not available today. Um, we've got apologies from John Carr, who's uh, on a steamboat today. Um, uh, Keith Sabin, who can't be with us and um adrian faulkner but he will drop in briefly at some point um and we'll uh, and we'll talk about bods when he drops in uh, um naptan when he drops in so that's apologies um so there was an action with triumph and mike to update on operator number of operators and things like that on bods i'm not well, sure as that's i don't think that's progressed actually tim right okay we'll probably get an update on that in a minute anyway yeah. um and um triumph and sarah were going to talk about <laughs> um some um text um which uh, i know they've been talking about so we can close that one um one that i realized that we didn't do mira was circulate the latest transport focus um reports so um we'll make sure we share the links to those um okay afterwards. Have you got them, Tim? because i've got them um here um, and yeah i wasn't sure how much time you'd allocated for um so just bear, give, give me one moment um but yeah we we've got the we've got the most recent um transport focus reports i've been reviewed for an hour um until three o'clock um and yeah. then depending on how much time we've got we've um <clears throat> there's a few things we could talk about which would be um the transport focus reports but also um you know how, how um mobility data um kind of intersects with placemaking to create more livable communities and um yeah that's on the agenda next mira after we've been through the minutes 15 right. minute neighborhood William, thank you <laughs> um and then um uh on that time, Keith um, Sabian asked me just to um, uh, raise um, the the need for lat long in Naptan um, because that's uh, causing uh, some challenges for him and a number of other data consumers. Um, then on journey planning um we haven't um arranged the atco ptic 
workshops on journey planning yet, um, but that's still something that uh, we're keen to do. Um, then um, there was a travel under travel line. Um, Mike and Amy, you were going to talk about costs for next buses service in Leicester. You're on the yeah. view, Mike. I think I um, emailed, uh, forwarded Mike an email in March, but I've not had a response to that. I don't know if he's had a chance to look at it yet. Right, apologies for that, Amy. Um, <laughs> I've not, I've not had a chance to look at that. I, I, I it's, it, I'll have to, I'll have to follow that up. So apologies for I, that. That's all right. I, I can resend that if you need. I'll find it. Yeah. Don't worry. Thanks. Cheers. Cool. Okay, and then um, the um, in the issues log um, there was a. Um, between Richard, um, who was Richard, yeah, Richard Hall and Mike. Um, again, you were popular, Mike, last time um, about getting access to the Eto Naptan viewer, which is probably <coughs> uh, been and gone I'm, I'm, now. We, we we were in contact, I believe, after the after the previous meeting. Um, I think the expectation is that the Eto tracking service will come to an end. Uh, very shortly, but uh, our, our hope and expectation is that the DFT will provide uh, an alternative for for the future. Yeah, I, I managed to do that, um, uh, referring referring it to a colleague so they could get access. So that that works. But yeah, you know, obviously, I'd be interested to hear whether it really is being withdrawn any minute now. <laughs> And be disappointed to see it go without an alternative. Well, we're, we're aware that uh, a lot of people are, are using it or at least getting access to it. So uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're glad that uh, people are using it. Yeah, Oops. and we'll uh, pick up we'll, on yeah, features okay. of interfaces and things under that time. Um, because uh, yeah, there'll be uh, some discussion about that, no doubt. So um, that's the end of the minutes unless anybody's got anything else on those no okay so um next up um we've got uh, an item grandly titled 15 minute neighborhoods um for this is something that's been rumbling around for a few years for those of you that um keep an eye on what's going on um, in other countries and um, places. Um, there's been quite a lot of work going on um, in places like Paris and some of the um, uh, cities in the States about how to make places more livable. Um, <clears throat> and um, talking with um, Mira, um about um this so she's going to give us some a bit of background and update because she's quite keen on us having some thinking time um on this about how as a group and an industry we might be able to help so mira over to you Sorry. Um, uh, Mira, your um, audio is not audible to yourself. Mira, your um, audio is not Yeah, we're not hearing you. Yeah, we're not hearing you. Okay. Okay. 
while we wait while perhaps for Mira to Mira. rejoin and sort her out, um, her audio problems, um, yeah. what I will do is I will. I've got a copy of the slides, which when I work out how to uh, view a decent uh, version of it. Right, okay. So, Tim, I think we're getting a lot of feedback from Mira's. Um, Mike, Mira, could you mute oh, yourself? Right. Do you mind? Yeah, she has, right. Great. So, uh, where is it? So, right. Hopefully, you can now um, see uh, my screen. Um, so, um, Department of Transport's been doing some um, work looking at um, mobility um, and um, how data can enhance the passenger experience, but in a bit of a wider context um, than than is is normal. Um, so the the vision for open transport that you'll have heard and seen before. Um, all about improving passenger journeys through better quality data, um, making data more open, um, making sure that it's complete um, and people are keeping it up to date and sharing it on a regular basis, um, which um, hopefully ends up with a position where um, rather than just having isolated sets of data, there is a place where you can go for um, all your transport data when you start to take a bit of a wider look um, rather than just um, a narrow focus on um, buses um, and what time they're running and things like that. Uh, fares for the first time through BODS is being available you will have seen a recent um, consultation on mobility as a service um, and some of the data requirements that might be coming out of that. Um, so starting to have a bit of a wider um, think about data and what it would mean. Um, journey planning apps are increasingly um, available. There are people doing some new and interesting things already with BODS data um, that um, haven't been done before. Um, and so you can start to see how some of those ideas you might be able to take forward um, at scale um, and do some more interesting things with if more data sets are available. Um, and that is trying to tackle the, the the wider environmental challenges that we've got as a country and as a as a world. Um, and transport is a major player in that. You know, it generates a lot of carbon. Um, it generates a lot of particulates and things like that. So, how do you um, do better bus rail integration? Um, a frustration that we've talked about in this group quite a lot. Um, walking, cycling, those sort of micro mobility, scooter, new modes type stuff where actually the data is is at the moment not that readily available. Um, how do you make sure that what you do is accessible so that if you've got a disability or an impairment, you can still get access and move around. Um, and um, how do you take advantage of some of the things that were happening during the pandemic um, with low traffic neighbourhoods where you're thinking more about 
giving more space to walking and cycling um, and active travel modes um, and the wider um, mobility as a service agenda, um, which has been talked about quite a lot over the last few years. So um, when um, TfL started to make their data available, um a few a good few years ago now um there were some new and exciting suppliers that came into the market doing some new and innovative things um and what the dft is trying to do is is take that um and scale it up to national level bods has now got tfl data in it so bods is complete england um and um, how can we uh, benefit from the work that TfL have done and the learning and the lessons that they've got? Um, then I'll share these slides um, afterwards, but there's some interesting um, things that come from some of the work that um, researchers have been doing recently. Um, uh, that we all know how long it feels um when you're stood at a bus stop and you don't know when the bus is coming you know time really drags um if you have to walk somewhere it feels a lot longer than perhaps it it really does um and interesting things like um if a, if a train is clean um the journey seems shorter really interesting sort of things from from uh, from the Netherlands there you know you wouldn't think about that sort of thing um yes we want clean public transport because it encourages people on but actually if it makes people think the journey's shorter that's a really interesting um effect so there's right. some, some really interesting work going on um at the moment hello Mira are you gonna oh hi Tim yeah sorry about that um yeah <laughs> um thanks not quite sure what happened there um yeah no that's great and um, thanks for starting the presentation that's um yeah great i've got a double um thank you um oh Teresa, i'm glad to see you're on the call as well um because um yeah one of the things that i meant to pick up with you about was um i remember a while ago you were talking about data journalism and had some really interesting some good points on that and um yeah that's something that we've been thinking about a bit more recently i suppose it all kind of ties into the same theme which is that we're really thinking about yeah we've we've, we've done a lot of work to improve the quality of data to create digital platforms to enable operators transport operators to publish data and app developers to use the data but then we just need to think about okay what sort of a an an, an, an impact for want of a better word unfortunately um what what sort of an impact do we want to have in society um and um and this is really why um my interest and attention has turned to this idea of the um here, here we've got the 15 minute cities or neighborhoods um and if you could have tied that into the context of the uk the 15 minute city or neighborhood is quite a i suppose a global um idea in the sense that it's you know we're seeing it come to fruition in other cities around the world um but actually in the context of the uk what does it mean here it, it, it's about leveling up it's about creating um you know complying with the, the, the sustainable development goals of the united nations so sdg 11 in particular um and um, what I wanted to do was just, I suppose, take this opportunity in this time with you to think about, OK, how much great work have we already done? Where does that take us to? And then where do we need to go in the future? And um, many of you, um, so I think Tim has already was through some of the, the, the slides about um, how journey planners um, enhance the passenger experience. And I think some of the really salient points to me from those slides are around, um, <clears throat> you, you know, essentially how, um, it, well, I suppose one of the things I found quite interesting in some of the research and stats was that 
um, where people have mat. So, so, so people, using public transport is just inherently complex. If you walk, cycle, use public transport, the reason why people still get in their cars is because you know your journey from A to B, from start to finish. It's it, it's one mode. You can get to the start point and the end point in that mode, and you will probably very likely know the know the way. Um, so um, when you all of a sudden decide to take public or active or um, shared travel, it introduces a layer of complexity. Um, and that layer of complexity then needs to be um, demystified almost. Um, and so that's what journey planning solutions like Google, like Apple Maps, like um, <clears throat> um, like City Mapper do. They they reduce that cognitive complexity. And many of you will already know that. I know that I don't need to to to, to teach you about that um but but there are other reasons why people don't use public transport public transport doesn't always compete on um journey times well actually one of the staggering statistics i saw here was that actually it, the quality of the map or the, the provision of maps and the perception of the map had more impact than the actual journey time taken um, and then the other things that really kind of resonated with me were just that, this idea that you, know, when people spend time waiting, that feels three times longer than the, the, than if you're you're not waiting. Um, and then also the impact of cleanliness as well. Um, and so I suppose what I'm trying to say is is that we'll 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 touch on the 15 minute city or neighbourhood in a moment, but. I suppose my starting point here would be that just as we've completed the mobility as a service code of practice consultation and we think about what we ask mobility as a service providers to do in the future, you know, beyond encouraging people towards healthier behaviours like active shared public transport, I think we actually also need to um, think about what those solutions need to provide beyond journey planning and ticketing. So you know, the provision of really high quality maps um, as part of those, making sure that journey plans are multimodal and that they incorporate some active travel. But also if you're thinking about how you create more livable places and communities, how are points of interest clearly signposted and indicated it in those solutions. So places where you can live, work, travel, um, exercise, where you can um, you know, eat, go to the cinema, um, you, you might be caring, facilities, libraries. How are all of these points of interest effectively signposted? Um, and how do you, how do these solutions, how do these digital solutions support the creation of community? Um, so how do they also make people aware of not only how to get from A to B, but also what is happening within A and B? So what sort of events, activities, and how can uh, how can the, the people interact with other members of their community as well? So it's it, what we're talking about here is going way beyond mobility and transportation and thinking about how the mobility and the transportation transportation connects us to the people and places that we love and that's ultimately you know the whole the whole point of transport and mobility is about connecting people and places so and um, so that's really i suppose what i wanted to touch on and to to think about what i think needs to be in our um in our mindsets and um and in the next generation, really, of, of journey planners or mobility as a service solutions, um, it needs to go way beyond um, journey planning, ticketing and real time service updates and really focus on the experience, the experience that the passenger has and their perception of using transportation, but also how it helps people connect to 
um, people to places. And, and there is something about productivity here as well and, and what those solutions can do to help people use their time more productively when they're on public transport. So giving them nudges to complete tasks. It might be their online food shopping or it might be a word or to enhance their cognitive performance or it might be to phone a friend or family member or yeah, you know, but but just making sure that that time feels like high quality productive time. Um okay, um so Tim, shall we shall we go to the bit the the you were on that the that that yeah, right. So so um can I just ask actually how many people are familiar with the concept of the 15 minute city? Oh, I did a talk on it at this conference yesterday. Oh, brilliant. Is that, is that you? Is that you, Dan? It is, yeah. Hi, Dan. How are you? Not bad, thanks. How are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good. Thanks for asking. Yeah, good. Um, OK, that's great. Um, yeah, so um, oh, what conference was it? Just out of interest. I, I'm still there. It's Modelling World, uh, where it's basically there's 250 transport modellers who are arguing the exact same point about localism and having points on your desktop effectively that you don't even need to use public transport for there's really kind of pushes towards micro mobility scooters there's lots of push towards improving cycle uh, ways low traffic neighborhoods uh, there's about 10 companies here that are all talking about the same the same kind of stuff at the moment um so yeah it's quite a well i saw this on the agenda i thought i must escape the conference and uh, come and uh, and hear a bit more <laughs> okay that's great um OK, um, so, so so the idea is that you, you know, I mean, a lot of us, many of us will know now that we spend you know, probably either, if not more time in our own home localities, certainly an equivalent amount of time in our own home localities as we do in our workplaces or um, and, 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 and I think that is as it should be. Um, if personally, I think the balance has to be right. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, you, you really the idea here is that you transform your cities into a network of urban villages. So people have their kind of urban village or urban retreat that they go to in their in their leisure time and when when they're at home um, and everything that they need is just you know, a 15 minute walk or cycle ride. Um, might need to use public transport, low, you know, bus, e-scooters, etc. Um, and then train we primarily use for intercity travel, which many of you will be familiar with the idea that train is primarily an intercity travel mode and then um, walking, cycling, bus, sea scooters, etc. more intra-city or local modes. Um, so we spend one or two days maybe in the city districts and then maybe four or five days in our neighbourhood or urban village. That might be changing slightly, um, you, you, you know, but... I think that feels, you know, most people are saying at the moment that they're going into the, you know, into their offices about two days a week. Um, it then brings with it a need to rethink the purposes of both city centres and also those urban villages as well. So what it does is it means that those urban villages, those, I suppose, those, the, what we call the suburban areas almost, uh, you know, the, the burbs, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and city centres might become places where um, if people are spending less time there and, it's not, and they don't just work in the city centres anymore, what is then the purpose of the city centre or the neighbour? The, 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 and you know, certainly in my view, I, I found it quite interesting when you go to your work and you have a look. Mira, your audios um, are gone again. Mira, sorry. Your audios are gone again. Sorry. Oh, just. Give her a second to see whether it comes back.
No. No. Okay. I will mute to stop the echo. Um, so, um, yeah, so how do um, we um, live and um, work in, in, in that so in in the sort of the the urban villages in the small areas, um, we've already said a few times it's not new. Um, it's hundred years old, going back um, to some of the uh, original planning um, in America, um, and over the last twenty thirty years, there's been quite a lot of work. Um, done about how you make some places more livable um, in in the UK um, and in parts of Western Europe. I think we're we're better off than a lot of the uh, the very large sprawling metropolises um, of um, the states and um, some of the Far East um, because we originally started our cities certainly in in the uk as villages that sort of coalesced so there's lots of little centers and things like that um and that's now something that um large cities are trying to um start to reinvigorate um my london boroughs did quite a lot of work um during covid um encouraging people to to stay more local when you couldn't um, travel long distances um, and uh, you know, reducing traffic to encourage more walking and cycling in areas. Um, and uh, and so there's some there's some good examples of 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 other places around the world where they've done um, quite a lot more proactively. Um, if we look at Paris, um, the mayor in Paris, um, she's done an awful lot towards um, making more local centres um, and making it easier to get around um, from where you live to your local shops and health and, and education. Um, um, and the key um, principles really are making sure that um, you've got the facilities people need in, in good proximity um that might be trunk network so it might be um a railway station close enough by but it's also um shopping and education um and making trying to make sure that um you've got places where people can um um take exercise can play um, so it's making sure that it's actually not too dense. Um, you've got green spaces for people to, to live in and things like that. Um, and also make sure that you've got um, enough diversity and you're not making um, silos and ghettos too much. Um, uh, people t like to um, congregate with, with similar minded people and um, similar cultures. Um, that's not necessarily the healthiest thing. So how do you um, uh, overcome some of these? So it's not as simple as going, oh, we're just going to make sure that there's a doctor's surgery within 15 minutes of everybody. Um, it's actually really quite a complex um, planning and logistical challenge. Um, and um, um, in, um, in the UK, um, we've got, a reasonable amount of, of local centres and things like that. But um, in London, for example, um, actually the journey times from where people live to some of the key um, amenities, there's parks and shops and things like that, quite a lot longer than somewhere like Madrid, for example. Um, nearly twice, twice, the, uh, twice the time that it would take somebody to get to some of those. So there's still quite a long way to go and a lot of thinking to be done. Um, we've talked about um, that. Um, 
touched on um, Paris. They, they're doing it in 15 minute. Um, other places are doing it in slightly different um, times and things like that. Um, but the, the mayor there and uh, Hidalgo, he's, he's been very active and proactive on this. Um, and uh, and it's certainly somewhere to um, read up on um, if you've if you're interested um, in um, what other people are doing um, with these uh, 15 minute areas. Milan and Melbourne, they're doing quite a lot. Melbourne have got some quite cha big challenges because yeah, that's really quite sprawled out and spread out um, city. Um, but uh, but they've got some very interesting uh, work going on um, and some more examples. Um, so that's the sort of the, the context the the challenge, I think, for us and um, where the department is coming from is to make this work. What mobility data do you need? What transport data do you need? Um, you know, we can leave it up to other people to, to an extent, to think about where um, hospitals might be and where some of the big, bigger things you might not have in fifteen minute. Um, but also, you know, education establishments and things like that. Um, but for us, really, um, I think our challenge is um, really what transport data have we got now that might be able to support some of this thinking support the sort of the tools um the transport planners might need um the, the conference that dan's at at the moment you know, how, how do we provide them with the data what new data might we need um and what standards um, might be needed to support that um, because we've got an opportunity to to actually make a difference um, in this work because there's a lot of places just beginning to think about it. Um, so it's a good point in time to uh, to actually be able to make a difference. Um, and um, uh, that feeds into the journey planning question um, and wider sort of traffic and travel questions um, and some of the things that, that we've talked about in PTIC in the past about how to present information um, and, uh, and, and how might roadworks get involved in um, disruption information, for example. Um, and so um, that um, we're not going to use Menti. Um, that was from a um, where this was originally um, used from. Um, there's a whole series of links in this slide deck, um, which, as I say, will circulate um, that might uh, that might help you uh, dig into things a bit more. But fundamentally, um, I think what we need to do now is properly think have a have a bit of a discussion about how we as a group might be able to help some of this thinking um and how we might um work with with other groups to to help progress some of the thinking around um these 15 minute neighborhoods um or the you know if we put 15 minutes aside, more localism and helping people get around their local areas. Um, so I don't know whether anybody's got any thoughts about. Um, how I'm, we might. I'm, ha I'm happy to share a few things uh, that I've learned in the last 24 hours. Um, one of the things I think is actually this doesn't no one's moaned here at the conference about a lack of provision of data. Uh, they, Bods has been mentioned a couple of times and actually how the availability of fair data is a really exciting thing, uh, reducing the barrier to cost of travel or actually just making it applicable so you can see it. 
Um, and the real time data uh, that's coming from BODS as well is something that has been quite it's been talked about here as well. So the people here who are people that work at Transport for West Midlands, Transport for Greater Manchester, uh, local authorities that know all about the data already. What they're really crying out for is the data that doesn't exist around cycles. Is there is there is a cycle route safe at the moment for some to go on? What's the provision of footpath data? Actually, is it segregated footpath? Is it safe walking, walking areas um, and things like that? And the other thing that's come up quite a bit is around policy with regards to new developments. So Transport for New Homes made a very good point yesterday that all kind of new development is still very much centri centrified on car access. And even though they might reduce the amount of car parking spaces that are available, then people just park their cars in the visitor space and things like that. And actually, uh, people aren't given the opportunity to use public transport or walking. There's an example shown on a, on a slide this morning where there's a new development, um, but then to get and walk, you could walk 15 minutes to um, your local shops and things like that, but yet there was, you had to walk on a 50 mile per hour road and there was no footpath on it. So people had to walk on the grass spurge as cars are traveling 50 miles an hour along. So whilst the modeling all said it's fine, you can do it, you can get there in 15 minutes. The reality was you were putting yourself in danger. And if you had a push chair or something like that, you would never use that as a route. So you're forcing someone to go in the car um, as part of that. Um, so yeah, it, it's 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 just a really interesting kind of, uh, kind of um, area. And people are thinking about it. It's, I said yesterday I was on a panel uh, with five other companies and all of us were all thinking about 50 minute neighborhoods, 20 minute cities, looking at how, how this can all be improved, how access is key. Um, but lots of it came down to is there the appetite um, of people to do it? And the other thing is actually you may spend all this money implementing a scheme, but then no one uses it. Um, and actually still a great perception that it, you can lead a horse to water, but someone won't won't utilize it. Um, and there's a quite a lot of that that was kind of talked yesterday. And maybe that's where you do bring in journey planners and things like that. But the, the problem is, if you start knowing about a journey you do already, you're not going to change the way in which you travel unless there's some sort of big disruption that causes you to, to reevaluate the way you're going to travel right now. Um, and so the big question is, is how do you force people to change? Actually, there's a question that's raised by some of the DFT yesterday. Is, you know, is it a marketing thing? Actually, is it more not a data thing? Are we need, do we need to market it more? Do we need to tax people? Uh, you know, roads uh, based pricing for driving and things like that. Is that the sort of thing that will push people out of their cars to, to try and change uh, and challenge the way in which they travel at the moment and um, be yeah, at it's been a hot topic at modeling world yesterday and today um so yeah there's definitely people when the right people are thinking about it but i don't think anyone's unfortunately got got the right answer at the moment mm. Mm. um just a couple of observations um one dan very welcome and very interesting i would say that there is absolutely loads of data available on cycling and walking the trouble is it's not in the public domain google knows and apple and others are available no doubt know exactly where we are all the time uh, as do many of our mobile telephony companies um, telefonica vodafone etc but they ain't gonna part with that stuff without without uh, lots of money um, so it's it's the shortage of stuff that is openly available that is the challenge, particularly for local authorities, etc. Um, you know, you can infer whether somebody's cycling or walking from their movement. Plenty of stuff on that, but it's it's all held by by big multinational corporations. So we haven't got a prayer until we can kind of democratize that and make it available to ourselves. <laughs> That's a very, very good point. I was having a chat with uh, an organisation uh, last night called Terralytics, and they effectively take in mobile phone data and they'll work out which mode of transport is used. But to have it, they've got to cut off the first five minutes of the journey, the last five minutes of the journey. So if you're looking at a 15 minute neighbourhood and you're cutting off the first five minutes of the last five minutes, you're not left with much data to to play with at all and it's prohibitively expensive still um it's seen as as the amber kind of the, the best kind of uh, data possible um but yeah there's, there's definitely kind of stuff going around that cycle streets is a organization that spoke yesterday and they think that i think they've got a really good cycle network 
um, and they are actively putting their stuff into OpenStreetMap at the moment, so OSM as a data set. So that's got really good walking routes and it's got really good cycling routes. The problem is there's not a lot of trust in local authorities and local government to use OSM data when they're pushed to use OS data via the Geospatial Commission as an authoritative data set. Um, but actually the data quality for active travel modes, uh, walking and cycling is way behind from Warden Survey to OpenStreetMap data, um, Yeah, uh, which is uh, yeah, another interesting and another interesting point. Just adding to your point there, Dan, about um, you were saying, is, is there other data that also needs to be available, perhaps some of the marketing stuff? Um, just listening to Mira's comments and Tim, you're kind of you're kind of driving force and focus for us to answer the question. And you were quite rightly talking about the transport data aspects of it. It's, but it sounds like there but are the, the kind of behavioural or behavior might not be quite the right way but but there are other things that we need to look at i'm not sure if they're data sets per se but it's interesting dan that you you said some of that came up um and it may not be a direct link but it's thinking more i think about influence and marketing and messaging and kind of dare i say it more storytelling or communication around this stuff as well as obviously fixing some of the the, the kind of critical issues yeah, 100%. Another interesting thing uh, on that is there's a study that we did uh, with Staffordshire County Council, actually, and what they did is they, uh, through Motia Stars, they produced a walk zone map for every new starter in primary school and secondary school, showing this is where a 10-minute walk zone map looks like. You know, mm. If you live within this area, please walk, don't drive or do anything else and by just giving the pupils that information in their starter pack as they started I had a 27 percent modal shift from car access to walking access so that was a very good example a very quick example of empowering pupils and parents to make their own decision and show them actually that travel is possible in a local way um, and doing it that way and then they promoted things like park and stride but if you live outside of that 10 minutes and drive park outside that 10 minutes and, and walk in and their kind of view was that if you get people walking from an early age it kind of goes through as a as an applicable mode but as a child if you get driven everywhere as a kid you think that's a norm and that's how you think travel is, is kind of done but trying to change people's perceptions from an early age will kind of help make walking cycling public transport a much more kind of uh yeah uh, attractive mode of transport should i say okay so uh that's extremely interesting as as a group what what can we do to help towards this? It, it 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 feels like, from what you know, Dan said and other people, you know, actually the data's there, um, but people perhaps don't believe it and trust it, um, and so is it? Do, do we want? Or should we be doing something that says, look, these are the data sources um, if you're trying to do something about this? Um, and here's some examples. You know, Staffordshire example there with schools will be, you know, an interesting one. Theresa, by the sounds of it's got some useful experience and things like that. Um, do, do we get a group together just to, you know, pull a couple of sides of A4 together as a bit of a um and actually this is where the data is and this is some good examples you might want to to use yeah does that feel yeah. like yeah tim darcy passenger here hi uh, yeah i think that's a really good idea i, th I think um you know if, if as an industry if we look at it that way you know if, we, if we're like dan was saying if we're if we're modeling something or if we found um a new way to model something then actually sharing that within the industry partners um, opportunity and downstream would be really useful um, because we're, we're starting to do that as well um, and we'd love to share what we're finding with the industry because it's a, it's a it's an industry problem to solve um, so yeah I think that's a really good idea but I think we do need to be able to kind of if you like you know sort of openly share some of these ideas um that we're dealing with data um because sometimes it gets um hidden or you know not moved on because of resource or something like that so i think that's a good idea personally 
Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, we'll we'll put out a doodle for um, when the interested people are available, and we'll uh, we'll sort something out uh, in the next few weeks, hopefully, to have a first uh, get together. Excellent. Tim. Thank you. That was very good. Um, we've been joined by Adrian from the NAPTAN team, who gonna... uh, is time limited. Well, um, I was, but I'm also chatty, and I was just going to raise a comment on the 15-minute cities thing, um, which is why I was putting my hand up. Sorry, I wasn't trying to... Uh... Oh, OK. I thought that was uh, make yourself a one known when you arrived. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, I was I was trying to be... So, well, um, we'd, we're starting some work soon looking at the NAPTAN schema, and I don't know, I, I wondered if there was thoughts from this group on how... Because obviously NAPTAN cover, currently covers public transport stops, um, but it could potentially cover location and the location of them. But it could also be extended to look at the location of cycle park, s scooting facilities and those sort of things. Um, has anyone in this group got any thoughts on whether that's an appropriate thing to do and would be helpful? Or is that, does that cross some boundaries which we shouldn't try to look at? Local authorities all, already manage um, like rail station entrances and things. Mm -hmm. um, and you can obviously taxi ranks are all in there. So if taxi ranks are in there, why not have cycle lockers? It's just whether the local authorities actually want to do it. Yes, Trisha, I think I was laughing to myself and thinking, ah, oh, yeah, Trisha's speaking for all local authorities here because there's not that many on the call from what I can see. So I, I'm <laughs> going to take this from this meeting that all local authorities are happy to provide cycle parking location information. Um, <laughs> just put that in the minutes, Tim, just make sure that's it. Oh, 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 I don't know who's doing the minutes. Um, but, um, uh, can I tell you NAPTAN upload is not working today? Uh, that old, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you can't I'm, tell trying, me. I'm trying to get a stop through for stagecoach and it's telling me I can't upload. Oh, those stagecoach ones are a bit funny, but yeah, okay. I um, I will take this as a support call, and I will pass this on to the NAPTAN I have inbox. E I have emailed the NAPTAN inbox. Don't worry. Uh, okay, phew. <laughs> um, the, the, so to 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 pick up on the uh, could NAPTAN be extended? Um, certainly the way the um Europe is thinking um is along those lines that the developments in um netex and trans model um over the last couple of years um have introduced new modes um support into trans model so the data structures are already there and at least version one of those structures uh are in the standards these they're not quite right because version one never is. Um, but uh, that's certainly the way that um, UITP and um, European Commission is thinking. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, Mark. Oh, someone's got the hand up as well, sorry. Neil. If... Neil. Neil, then maybe Mark, I think you were, were going to come in as well. If we have you second, if that's yeah. OK. I was just going to say if you if you were thinking about extending it to to cycle um rental so like your Boris bikes or whatever and um car clubs as well why not car clubs if rather than have uh, local authorities be responsible for capturing the data make it a condition of license for starting up your business that you provide GIS point and polygon data Yeah, that's a good shout. So a bit of a mixed model on where the data is actually coming from. Yeah, because <clears throat> these these guys are probably presumably going to refine where their places are anyway. And actually, in some cases, like your line bikes and scooters and all that sort of stuff, there might actually not be docking stations. You, you'll just be sort of pinging real time locations of where the things are available. Potentially. Having walked around the streets of Birmingham last night, I can definitely confirm they are docked around every random place possible. There's yeah, scooters uh, left, right and centre. 
But, well, uh, yeah, there's probably a high spatial autocorrelation with bridges <laughs> and rivers. Uh, <laughs> I wonder, that feels to me like that's where the boundary might sit, though, with Naptan, given what Naptan is designed to do in terms of um, being a bit more sort of long term infrastructure can tell you about the conditions potentially of cycle facilities and what is there, but actual locations of individual bikes. It feels like those companies have got that model wrapped up in a way that we perhaps don't want to get too involved in. Don't uh, tell me what the MPTG locality code is of a um, freestanding bike that could be parked anywhere. I think there could be a shout for what sort of facilities there is there secure bike storage or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, stations and uh, depots and larger things. I think there's definitely a call for that sort of information to be to be provided. And um, I think that could be a nice tie in between that time. But I think yeah, you try to do too much detail or get too much, you end up over complicating it, which is never, never a good thing. Yeah. yeah um, um, sorry, Tim. No, you go. I was going to say, Mark, do you want to come in? And then Darcy's got his hand up, I think. Uh, these are just minor points uh, for Tim, I guess. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to be, be part of that group to understand what the use cases are. And I think maybe we include academia into there as well, because they're using open data to do their own research. And there may be some good news stories from that as well. Um, and in terms of the upload, I think dft.gov.uk was down earlier. It, it may be back now, but that might be why. Um, it wasn't working. Uh oh, that's somebody else's problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, Darcy. Oh uh, yeah, hi. Yeah, just a point on the uh, bike share thing. Um, there, there is a um, GBFS specification or general bike share feed spec um, openly available. So the location is interesting, but the location of where the bikes or scooters actually are is probably more useful as well. So it's not just a static um, data set um, that we mm -hmm. need with, with bike share and things like that. That's just my just a point. Noted. OK. Tim, I'm going to hand, well, I mean, oh, back well, up to you because I jumped in on your point there. And Yeah, no, 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 that, that's fine. That's fine because I was about to say effectively what Darcy said that you know there is already standards work out there um that a lot of these support um we uh, but that conversation gets us neatly onto um Daptan, um <laughs> more generally which is which is why you jumped on Adrian isn't it yes sorry that I can't stay for the whole thing um but we're getting to the end of our sort of Naptan project and things are getting a bit um, tasty, as they always do, I guess, towards the end. So a bit pushed for time, I'm afraid, this week. Um, I had a few things that I just wanted to go through quite quickly. Um, if anything, if people want to have a longer conversation, then I'm happy to perhaps do, um, have that later. We have got two public meetings this month, uh, one to talk about um, stop naming and one to talk about the Naptan data quality management tool and how we're going to replace that. Um, I wanted to focus just a little bit now just on, on the Naptan redevelopment because we haven't been to, to one of these meetings in a little while to give you an update. So just to let you know how things are going, we've got some people uh, like Tricia actually who are testing for us um, our new upload service. So a way of getting uh, data into Naptan. Obviously, the download has been there for the last six months for everyone to, to use. Um, and what we're hoping to do in July is to open that up to all of the local authorities so that everybody will be able to upload into the new Naptan. Um, and at the, roughly the sort of same time, also provide a new um, NPTG um, localities download as well. So doing both of those things in um, July. And then what we'd like to do towards the end of August is to switch off the old system completely, or at least redirect away from the old system so that everything, you know, the whole aim of doing the Naptan redevelopment was to give it a strong, resilient foot in so that we can develop it in the future. And I think we're nearly there. And so we're looking to to switch everything off in at the end of August um, or mid to end of August. We'll email out 
more information on that, but um, it's coming close to the end. Now, as part of that, they were going to do something that hasn't been done in 20 years, and therefore I'm slightly nervous about it, that it's possibly not as big a deal as I'm thinking it is. But the Naptan schemas have sat in the same place, in the same file location, and have been published to the same place since I've been around, and I think possibly since Tim's been around, or maybe not quite that far. Um, we need to move them because they're on, on the legacy system. And I don't know what sort of problem that might cause for other people's systems. I know it would have broken the old NAPTAN if we'd have just done it without changing anything on the old NAPTAN, because every time we did a validation, it went to the external schema, found it, and then performed the validation. And I, I think I saw that Aidan and Keith are on the call um, from the software providers. So I guess this is a, an opportunity for me to flag, we're going to change this. I don't know what it's going to do to your systems. And if that's something that worries you, perhaps come and have a chat with me because um, we we will probably put a redirect in and it'll probably be fine. But it's just a bit of an unknown and I am slightly concerned about what will happen. So we're going to reach out to the software companies and discuss that with them. Um, I'll pause there. A couple of suggestions, Adrian, um, which mm -hmm. the software companies will no doubt uh, confirm. Uh, and with web services, it is trickier. But a lot of people will be following a, an embedded link or whatever. Um, a 301 or 304 redirect should work in most circumstances as long as the reciprocal system can be educated by that redirect. Um, but it, it is worth your software company um, doing a trawl, assuming they use something like Google Analytics, to see where the traffic is coming from. Uh, analyze that and then push out something to the um, the administrators of each. There'll be there'll be kind of majority users who are getting it all the time and there'll be slow and occasional users and you can't really legislate for who's going to have a problem. But obviously the big customers who are the regular users need to be served well and it might be worth a, 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 a an email to their, their systems administrator to warn them. Just a few thoughts. No, thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I certainly, to the people that I know that it potentially affects will be in touch. Uh, it's the unknown <laughs> unknowns that is always the problem. Um, I'm not sure how far we can get with the analytics. Um, we've had a look at that in the past and it's been a bit patchy, but I'll, I'll give that another look and see what we can work out. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, what this me? Oh, so what we have one more thing. Uh, I've as part of the sort of work that we're doing at the moment, we're doing some work just to look at improving the data um, in NAPTAN. So just some of the stuff that we, you know, we've come across a number of things that we think, oh, that's not quite right. Um, so we've just been having a bit of a deeper dive to try and uh, do, you know, always trying to improve the quality of the data in NAPTAN. Um, and so we might be coming out to some of the authorities with some some um, tweaks here and there. Um, so just to flag that, you know, if, if anyone sees anything that they think is not quite right with the data, please do get in touch because we've got a little team of people looking at things at the moment so we can certainly investigate and perhaps make some corrections. If you've if you've had a long standing bugbear, I've got one that there's a college that's changed its name, but the bus stop hasn't. Um, I'll be reporting that. But if there's anything like that that you see, please do get in touch um, and we'll we'll pass that on to the team. Um, and then we've got the the future of NAPTAN. So we, we, we spent all this time rebuilding NAPTAN so it's on a re robust footing. Um, and we've got some work starting this week or next week um, with a company called Deloitte, you may have heard of them, um, who are going to help us do some work on the future of NAPTAN, which is just to look at to look at things like the schema and how it might change in the future and what it might need to accommodate. Do you know, do we need to do things with plus bus? Do we need to do things with school stops? Do we need to do get more information on platforms for rail stations uh, and look at how we do those sort of things and get rail stations in a better state in NAPTAN. Um, so look at some of those questions. Um, we've not got a huge amount of time, so it might not be able to tackle all of them, but certainly to give us that future view of what NAPTAN is so we can give the signals to, to local authorities and software providers on, on what we you think the sort of future direction of travel for NAPTAN is going to be. Um, there will be a permanent team who are able to make changes to NAPTAN, so we hopefully will leave it in a better condition than we found it in terms of an ongoing support team. So rather than just doing reactive stuff, we'll have a team that are working on it on a full-time basis. Um, 
And just a signal that that may or may not, I'm not entirely sure, mean the end of my working on things because come come the end of what we call the project in September, that could be the time that I move on to um, digitising the HR forms or I could be sent to Kent or whatever the department wants to do with me. Uh, but it's not entirely within my gift to control that. So um, Sarah, who's on the call, will be the long term sort of home for uh, Naptan stuff and uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to to take your calls um, uh, and deal with any queries post September. Absolutely, I'll be here for that. <laughs> Should they take you away? <laughs> yes. So not confirmed one way or the other to be honest at the moment, but it's probably likely that I will be. Um, any questions on any of that? Well, thank you very no. much for having me. Oh, sorry. No, I was just. Saying no, thank you. And uh, <laughs> I'll, if, I will if probably you see you at the next September, one. even if it is to Kent and they're lovely folk down in Kent, um, then um, uh, yeah, all the best for the future and thank you for your work on that plan because I suspect the next PTIC meeting will probably be middle of September or something. Oh, by me, yes. Oh, well, I might still be around for that one. We can get the bunting out for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not ready with the farewell party yet. Well, you'll have to attend yeah. that one. <laughs> I was just going to ask about the the replacement for the Eto World um, view. I think, please. I don't know what its official title is. I apologies for. Uh, Do you know what I think? Um, we need to call it the Naptan Data Quality Management Tool. Um, right. I think that's that's okay. the safe, safest thing to oh. call it. Um, okay. Eto World did provide it, but I think to be fair to Eto World, they provided it a long time ago. And Hello, um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so bearing that in mind, so we are we're redeveloping something at the moment, um, but it's taken us a bit longer than we we'd hoped. So there there is now going to be a bit of a gap between us switching it off and. Um, and re replacing it with something else. Um, there's a team of people working on it. Um, I think Sarah was hosting a meeting on that at the end of the month to to go through it in more details. But um... yeah, it's, sorry, it's it's an internal team. Um, so that you know, and we're just gathering the thoughts on the aspects of it that we need to. Re well, I keep saying replace, but you know, the tool that we need to create basically for people to use. Um, and the meeting that we hold on that will be gathering people's views and thoughts on that. But unfortunately, yes, there will be a bit of a gap between uh, one, uh, the IT ITO world one being switched off and our one being made available. Um, but yeah, we're going out to people to ask for the help and input for that. And then after we've got it up and running, we'll have sort of um, a testing sort of time frame as well and be asking people to come on board to give us their feedback on the tool. Is there no way that the gap can be bridged by just extending it a bit longer, like in, as as seems to have been happening up to now? Yeah, I mean that was looked at, but um, it we've really stretched the contract and times with Eto World and the the type of tool and um, you know the fact that we're not maintaining it um, currently um, it is just as it is. Um, so unfortunately, that's the decision at the moment. If there are um, yeah, Mike, if there are issues that that causes you, that there's anything that we can do in the interim to help, then happy to take have a conversation offline and see if there's anything we can do to to plug the gap on an interim basis. Um, Absolutely, yes. Know. Please get in touch, yeah. Right, OK. I mean, what, what alternatives can you offer then? What sort of things, I mean? Um, I don't know. I don't I don't know what problem that's I, I don't know what problems it will cause uh, of you in terms of <clears throat> given that it, it, yeah, sorry. Come. A lot of people use that tool as a, a sort of like you say to to view basic details without having to download data sets. You know, I know people in bus companies who are like data analysts, they use it as well. So just stopping it will will cause some people. I mean, no doubt there are other tools available, but um, they may not be free or they may not be wi widely known about like this is. Yeah. yeah. Um, like I say, we, we could. Sorry. Yeah, it is. We could if we could we could discuss this offline um, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, just understanding which parts of it you'll be able 
be needing to view. Um, but as you've said, it, it might be that it, it has to be a full download. But yeah, we can look into it in more detail. Rob, OK. Thanks. So I just wanted to um, chime in for a minute there, if I could. Um, we did prototype um, uh, a basic Naptan data quality tool, I think going back about 18 months or so. Um, this was when the um, idea of switching the original um, Eto World tools off was first mentioned. Um, but the project really from our side never got off the ground development wise because um, of the uncertainty. Um, every time we thought it might be a useful thing to, to, to develop as a commercial product, we found out that the existing contract was being extended. Um, and to be honest, as things currently stand, we're hearing it will be switched off at the end of June. Um, but we've heard this several times before, and so there's not really a commercial case for ourselves or I guess for any of the other software suppliers to invest a lot of money in building an Aptan data quality tool only to find that there's no market for it, um, either because people are reluctant to start paying money for something that they used to have free um, or because um, it transpires that the, the other one uh, is extended again or is indeed replaced by a new free tool from the DFT um, um, but yeah, really, I it will be. I just want to suggest that you know we we are here and other suppliers also are here um, and we could help um, but it's very difficult to put something together um, when we don't know how long it's going to live for effectively Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I say, the overall the overall goal is to in-house it in DFT and there is a team already working on the code for that. So it's definitely something that we are going to be producing. Uh, unfortunately, there is a lag, like we said, with that time frame with a bit of a gap. But, you know, the, the overall end point is that DFT will house a tool and it will be free to use for everyone. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the only thing we could say with a lot of certainty is that at the end of June, the, the old one will be switched off this time. Um, I think, as Sarah mentioned, we really stretched out the um, situation beyond its um, redeemable uh, sort of qualities, I'm afraid. So it's definitely um, no extensions past June. Um, but yeah, there will be that gap. Uh, yeah. So just a quick one for Sarah, probably. Um, when, when will the new tool be ready? You said your developers are working on it now. What's, what's the roadmap look like on that one, please? Sure. So it will be the latter end of the year, like the, the the sort of the I don't know if it depends on what year year you work on the third or fourth quarter of this year. Um, so towards sort of September really is when we're looking at. But we'll discuss that a little bit more in the public meeting that we'll be holding. Um, it's just making sure that we've got the right inputs and mapping and visualizations for the data points. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else on Naptan? No. OK. Um, Thanks, everyone. See you again. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Um, if we then um, pop back to bus open digital service. Um, Triumph's not here today. He would normally give us um, an update. And I think Mira's uh, departed. Mark, have you got anything you can say about um, routes and timetables and location data? Because as I know, uh, Stephen's going to talk about fares in a second. I'm looking at the ABOT uh, roadmap at the moment. Um, we're looking at how that, those data sets are consumed. Um, in the ABODS environment. So I'm looking for um, user feedback. I'm speaking to lots of local authorities and internal agencies as well to understand how they're consuming and using the ABOD system. So if there's anyone on the call that wants to offer any input into that process, um, that'll be welcome. Uh, welcome to be received. Um, but yeah, from the BODS point of view, no, I, I don't have any updates. Okay, thank you. Um, in which case, Stephen, welcome. Um, and you're going to give us an update on fares. Yeah, I was just going to go through, I guess, the um, 
the plan for affairs over the next uh, six to nine months. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't around the last peak tick, so I guess for FERS has kind of been in stasis a little bit. Obviously, the regulations were passed. You know, the deadline for simple FERS came in in January this year, um, but we've seen that obviously, you know, probably only about 50% of registered operators have published any FERS, uh, and there's quite a lot of, um, I guess, quality issues, a lot of inconsistency between the types of NetX that have been published. So I'm just going to do a brief slide deck, I guess, on what the the roadmap for that um, for that is just hold on while I present. I assume we can see that, can we? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So basically, there's like four, I guess, main uh, work items coming up um, for fares data on faults. Um, these are sort of broken down into simple fares validation version one, simple fares validation validation version two. Um, the general guidance documentation for publishing NetX on pods and then complex fares as well. Um, I'll start on the first piece because that's essentially what's going on right now. Um, so the plan is we will bring in validation for simple fares published on pods um, in the near future. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have two iterations of the validation logic to ensure that there isn't, I guess, that the issues that probably has been previously with trans exchange validation and Siri validation, um, I guess, comms issues with the system supplies, etc. Um, so what's going on at the moment is um, just writing some rules and guidance to go with those rules. Um, those will be sent out to the ETM suppliers. Uh, or when I say ETM suppliers, what I really mean is the NetX suppliers, the ETM suppliers that supply NetX to pods. Um, those will go out tomorrow. And really, these rules were initially addressed at standardization more than anything, rather than, um, you know, data quality. Very much about ensuring that the, the data coming out of TKT, the data coming out of VIX, and the data coming out of uh, the Create Fair service is all of the same structure. Um, and all the same elements are there for each different type of product. So, yeah, as it says there, we're going to be addressing things like file structure, user profiles, so it gets, you know, making sure that, you know, the, the, the ticket that the user is for is, is specified. Um, and then things like tariff based product type, what we've seen is some inconsistency about how these things are, these things are being written into NetX and that obviously causes issues when you're analysing data and you're trying to pick out specific products, what have you. So the plan is that that'll go out tomorrow um, and there'll be a sprint uh, where the ETM suppliers uh, and major operators will, I guess, look through that logic and feedback their final comments. Uh, and then we'll move forward to development. Um, a report structure is going to have to be designed. Um, we're looking to start development work on the, the first version of the validator in mid-August. Um, and I guess the current BODS roadmap allows two months for that development work. Once that's released, there'll be a pause between, I guess, um, the validation logic appearing on staging and it's released a live production environment. Um, so this time we can work through, I guess, the, the errors that are being thrown up with the system suppliers before we um, go live with it to avoid, I guess, lots of smaller operators getting error reports that they don't really fully understand. Um, and that's the timeline for the simple VAERS validator. Uh, just as the, the second iteration of the validator will, the, the planning for that will begin in September and um, you know, there'll be user research process that will go through to October. Um, so again, we'll be consulting on the new rules we're bringing in, and those will be affecting things like versioning, which I think Tim, you'll know, is can be a bit of a thorny issue, and it's more of a thorny issue in um, NetX because every frame can be versioned to the nth degree. So we need to uh, come up with a sensible solution for that, and things like prices, because we know at the moment, um, I guess the way that some operators are keying in their fares into the ETM machines is not um, how it should be. So, for example, they're using um, cell based structures for flat fares and things like that, and that's sort of coming out of NetX. But we're going to focus on that as a data quality issue in the second trip of the validator rather than addressing it first time around. And then the dev work on that is planned to begin in mid November. And the bit that's most relevant to this meeting, I think, and specifically why I'm here making this presentation is that we will be writing, um, or we are in the process of writing, um, a NetX for BODS guides document. This, this will obviously cover um, 
the simple fares and what's being validated for, but it will cover other things that will be checked for in post publishing checks and things that we'll probably never check for in an automated sense, but we still sort of expect or giving advice on how we expect things to be coded up, such as circulars and other, you know, unusual routes. Um, and what we're hoping to do is consult with the wider industry uh, in September on that documentation. So I guess what I would hope is that Although I, I noticed, Tim, you said that actually peak tickets in September. I, 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 I've made the assumption that it's actually in October, so that may um, affect my time scale slightly. But um, yeah, the plan we is. We can I have guess, extra meetings. That's not a problem. Oh, well, I'm sure people will be delighted to have an extra meeting to discuss NetX. But, um, you know, if that's necessary, then that's what we'll do. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm here to say to, to, to the people at the meeting is that, you know, there'll be a wider NetX the board's guidance document being published um, and we would welcome any feedback from anybody that's ever got any interest in FAIRS data, you know, whether from the consuming side or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's that's penciled in for the next PTIC. Um, and then the, the documentation initially will cover for simple FAIRS, complex FAIRS coming later in November 2022. Um, and just to address complex FAIRS, We'll actually be talking to the uh, ETM suppliers um, and operators about the complex fares um, alongside the second iteration of the simple fares rule. So that's in September, going through to October. Um, and obviously that's that's really focusing on things that have not been addressed yet, um, such as post pay, cap products, and uh, multi operator and multimodal products, um, discounted products, and through fares. Now, not all of those are actually complex fares, they're actually simple fares, but they've not been produced yet ultimately by any supplier. Um, and we need to sort of get to grips with that. So we'll be, you know, dr drilling into that and specifying what what we expect to see in an NetX file for all those kinds of products. Um, and again, development work will go hand in hand with the second iteration of the simple fares validator um, and begin in November. Again, I've penciled in um, a couple of months of development work there, but hopefully something will be deployed before Christmas. Um, and then post publishing checks. So this is more, you know, post publishing post -publish checks would be more about, um, I guess, checking the relationships between um, the trans exchange and the NetX to ensure that, you know, if 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 a trans exchange file has been published, that there are accompanying NetX files for it, things like that. Post publishing checks will be looked at um, in early 2023 um, for planned development work in February, um, and that's basically it. So if anybody has any questions about um, the NetX plan or the, the first roadmap, um, please shout out. Take that as a no. Yep. Thank if, uh, you know, if anybody has any questions about it or the work that's going on, then um, you know, drop me a drop me a line. Um, Steve, what's my email address um, in the chat? A quick question, if that's oh. OK. Yeah, that's um, fine. What, what do we think, how do you think compliance is at the moment and, and matching it to, to BOD's data? Have you got any kind of feedback of how that, how that matching is going? Because I have had issues before about the mismatching of stops of simple fares and using different stops, codes, different sides of the roads, but only, only being provided for one direction in the NetX data, whilst the trans exchange has got the northbound or the southbound stop as two different NAPTAN stops. Has any work been done, has all this kind of validation work address some type of issues, do you think? Uh, the, the validation work will not address specific things like that. That's more for post publishing checks. Um, okay. Because obviously the, the amount of processing that it takes to um, check all the stops in a NetX file to the relative trans exchange files, which would take a long time. Um, so the validation is very much about ensuring the data structure Steve correctly and the right elements are included. Yeah. Um, in terms of comparing it to trans exchange, that will come later. Um, although that is on the horizon, I think initially the only thing we'll be comparing against trans exchange will be the the line IDs um, to ensure that the NetX that's being published does at least relate to something that's on BODs. Okay, thanks. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um... I think you know that question I, that I had in the in the minutes, which is about the proportion of operators not on bods. I suppose is it relevant to us out here? Because well, um, I think last time I looked, it was it was approximately fifty percent of all operators in scope of bods have published NetX so far. 
Yeah, and what about the wider thing in terms of just bods generally, not 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 net uh, I, I, I can't comment on that. I, yeah, I okay, that's, that's, that's yeah. That's a question for is, before we move yeah, off. Is not um, about. I'm sure that you know Tim can get those figures. Yeah, because also yeah. presented on a fortnightly yeah. basis. I think. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, I, I will. I'll circulate them. But I mean, generally, timetables. The the figures that I got last from them was about ninety five percent of operators are supplying timetables. Um, compliance with the profile um, is probably about eighty percent. Um, so quite a lot of people updated data just before the validation was put in place um, in the autumn. Um, and they won't update those timetables until they've got new timetables for schools or contracts change and things like that. So um, there's still a reasonable number of ones that don't meet the profile, but you know, 95% of operators, something like that, supplying data, which is pretty good. Um, and um, AVL, Again, there's a good um, number of people providing location data feeds. Uh, that that's above ninety percent in the last um, uh, stats that I saw. David. Yeah, it was just to say that to Mike that there's on Bods itself now. There's a data catalog, and that shows you all the operators that have published and which bits they've published. And it gets updated nearly every day. There's about 250 compliant um, AVL feeds because that's what we're concentrating on at the moment. They're not all ours. Um, and there are about 10 or 12 that aren't. But there are then some missing because that only takes in about 300. And it depends how many operators you actually think should be on BODs because we've got some operators who are claiming they're exempt because they're either section 19 or 22, or they claim to have come to some agreement with the way they've registered their service as a school one. Um, and it's going through some checks at the moment to see whether um, the traffic commissioners agree with that. Right, thanks for that, David. Yeah, I have not had time to look at bods lately with pressure of all the work, but yeah. yeah I so presume if you, if, you, the... if you browse data, there's a box yeah. called Guide Me, and it shows you underneath what you can do, and it, it leads you to the catalogue. Right. I, I will I will have a look at um, Robert's coaches then. <laughs> yeah, they're AVLs compliant. Don't look at their trans exchange. Ah, right. So their timetables are still. Last time I looked, they were months out of date. Yeah, unfortunately, if if one timetable is wrong in any upload, it prevents the whole lot being uploaded. Right. And until that one gets fixed by the operator, um, it it can't be done. Right. OK, thank you. That's really useful. Cheers, David. That's an amazing level of detail. Either that, David, or you're tipped off that Mike was going to ask a question about that specific operator. I can assure you it wasn't tipped off, but uh, it's just <laughs> <laughs> very impressive. <laughs> it's an old chest, not that one is. Fair enough. OK, um, I will um, get updated stats um, available. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to raise about bods? No. OK. Um, journey planning, I plan, therefore I am. Um, if you remember back um, a couple of meetings ago, um, John Carr posed a question to the group about what journey planners should do um, and how they should behave um, after he uh, nearly failed to uh, to get to a football match uh, in London. Um, uh, that 
was um, going to result in a workshop between uh, us and um, ATCO. Um, that hasn't um, uh, been set up yet, but um, in light of our discussions about 15-minute neighbourhoods and, and the data needed and what journey planners might want to look like in future, that feels like it's uh, an important group to make sure um, actually meets um, and it might be a follow on um, from uh, from the uh, from the uh, group that we're going to set up to uh, to look at, uh, at, at the data and good practice um, for the 15 minute neighbourhoods. So um, there's more to come on that one, but I haven't got um, anything new to share with you, um, unfortunately. Um, travel line projects. Um, Amy, have you got anything you want to update us on? Um, I haven't prepared anything, but I can, I can share some. Yeah, should share some things. Yeah. Um. Uh, so we've just taken delivery to test of work package one from our project with base map uh, to take data from bods which is looking at first group data um, to start with. So that's ingestion of everything that's um, validated on pods. We run some uh, some of our own checks on that, make some adjustments to do what we need to do to align it with TNDS. So splitting into in individual lines, um, making sure there's no overlapping dates, um, running that in a TNDS build and publishing that on our test environment. So that's on our test journey planner now um, and we're working with the operator to test that output um, so we're getting quite close um, with that now um, while that's in test we're moving to look ahead at further operators um, or travel line regions as well um, but we're also waiting for some clarification I think on I think it's the tickets type data where BODS verification is is failing files um, for some lines where other lines in that uh, the same registration group don't have the same version number so there's some incompleteness in some of those data sets that we want to take so we can only kind of move so far ahead with those until that's resolved or clarified um another project we're just sort of starting is i think during sort of covid time we did a quick solution to put messages on travel and info um so we could attach notes to specific services um, where we serve the timetables or journey plans to give information about um, masking rules it was at the time um, and we're looking at working with the call centre provider um, Travel and Cymru or well be acquired by Transport for Wales now um, on a project to use that existing functionality but to add in other types of alerts like upcoming roadworks or stop closures events and things that might affect the service to give travel and info users a bit more information, but also uh, help our call centre agents because they use the, the site to assist callers. Um, and then I guess Plus Bus, um, we've chosen the Plus Bus e-ticket design uh, and our DG will be sending the standard out to rail retailers in the next week or so. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not as close to the Plus Bus project, so if there are any questions on that, I'll, I'll have to take those back to to Julie. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the updates I can think of at the moment. If anyone's got any questions that I can take back for Travel Line. No? OK. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in which case, uh, EU standards development. Um, There's uh, not as much activity um, as in public transport standards development as there was um, a few months ago. Um, most of it is is now waiting for SEN um, processes to complete. Um, so uh, Siri update is still not published. Um, it's well overdue. Um, we're not quite sure what's going on um, and why. Um, but um, so I've given up 
I'm not going to give you a date of when Sue 2.1 will be available um, because, um, yeah, <laughs> they provide a template to put all the text documentation in. And then when you submit it, they go, that's the wrong word version. And you go, but it was your template that you supplied. <laughs> um, so all sorts of shenanigans going on. Um, so I've given up trying to predict when things will be available, but um, the schema is available on GitHub, um, as has been reported previously. Um, and I'm happy if you trying to use the 2.1 schema um, to uh, to help you access drafts of the documents and things like that, that will help you understand it. Um, the um, accessible information profile that's being developed um, will be completed over the summer. Um, so probably this time next year it will be formally released as a as a as a standard but again um if you're interested in accessible information um you know um the sort of things about you know has a bus stop got a raised curb how do you get from platform a to platform b how do you might you know you collect that data and code it up then talk to me and i will um share the work so far on that um i say that because i know that um there's quite a lot of work going on on the rail network at the moment collecting some of that accessibility data i didn't know whether any of you were involved in that um otherwise um yeah it's all pretty quiet there's a lot more development work going on on the road network standards um, at the moment, um, so um, Datex um, and TPEG um, updates. Um, if that's of interest, I'll uh, I'll talk to you about that um, separately. Um, but that's not really for this group. Um, is there anything anybody wants to ask about? EU standards. No. OK, um, anything for the issues log? We've not had anything new. And we haven't got anything outstanding, by the way, either. Which is amazing. I can't believe that all these data standards are perfect. No, if you do come up with anything, then please do let us know. We can raise an issue and get it formally raised with the relevant um, people that manage it. OK. In which case, that gets us to uh, any other business. Anybody got anything? No. OK, um, in which case, um, next meeting um, we would normally have it. Um, well, this meeting would normally be uh, a bit later in, in June historically, um, which means that the next one probably um, September. Um, it's quite congested with different events back end of September, early October. So um, we'll have a look and try and make sure we avoid them um, as best we can. And, and if there's nothing else from anybody, we'll bring this to a close. And you've got 15 minutes of your life back. So uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs>